Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining tonight's Comptroller's Meet and Greet. This event is being sponsored by Place NYC, which is a parent-led organization that advocates for high quality, challenging curriculum uh, and education for every student in all DOC uh, New York City public schools by increasing the academic rigor of all school curricula and is one of the fastest growing parent-led advocacy groups. As one member of PLACE, I'm excited to be here tonight and with me is Vita LaBella, from, uh, co-treasurer from PLACE NYC and Kashik Das, who will be both moderating the event. Uh, with that, we would like to welcome Michelle Calusa Carrera and Zach Iskell. Uh, I'm now gonna turn this over to Vito and Kosh, uh, Kush. Uh, I also go by Kush. You might hear them go back and forth a little bit. My friends call me Kush. Use whatever you like. But uh, I think to, uh, we're going to have Vito go over the ground rules and format for tonight. Uh, not many ground rules, but he'll go over the format and we'll go from there. Well, listen, so tonight is very, very informal. Certainly not a debate. We just uh, want our community to get to know the candidates. And that, that's too bad, Vito. Michelle and I are ready to take the, take the gloves off right now. Uh oh, <laughs> no, listen. <we're> <laughs> Well, if you like, we can do that. We can arrange for that. Uh, right? Change it a little end. bit, but yes. <laughs> Michelle, Michelle, one person in this field I don't want to fight with. All right. So. <laughs> I think that's probably smart. I think I heard she walked the whole length of Manhattan, so I think she's ready yeah. for you if uh, you decided to do that. Um, but anyway, so uh, thank you for that. Just getting me out of my uh, my uh, OODA loop. You have to Google what that is. Um, but so tonight, instead of having a, a traditional candidate statement. We're going to ask um, both of you um, individuals to do, that both of the candidates to do, is to just tell us something about your own educational experiences um, when you all were growing up, K to 12. Go ahead, Michelle, you first. Okay, great. Um, so I, uh, I attended public school uh, almost all my life until I went to college. I grew up in Nashua, New Hampshire, uh, and uh, went to public school. I, I graduated second in my class. I was editor of the high school paper. Uh, I was able to take advantage of uh, AP courses, uh, which helped a lot. And I was in a track system there as well. And then uh, upon graduation, I went to Wellesley College where I majored in economics and Spanish. And uh, after that, I went to, became a journalist. I was the editor of the high school paper and the college paper. And then once I graduated, I went to Univision in Miami uh, where I was a producer and then went on to have a TV career uh, totaling 30 years, finishing 21 years at CNBC, where I was the chief international correspondent. And I, I couldn't have had that tremendous career without a really good education. And I look back on, on my teachers with fondness and uh, I'm very distressed that there are so many children in the city and the country that don't have quality education right now. It's, it's a, a terrible disservice to them and to our country and our city. Did you go to, miss, uh, did you go to school here in New York City? No, I did not go to school in New York City. I, I grew up in New Hampshire. And when I was little, the second I knew that New York City existed, I was coming here. You know how a dog knows how to find their way home? That was it. It was like, you know, a beacon calling me. I couldn't wait to get here. New York City calls a lot of people from all That's over right. the world, all over the country, That's right? Right. Yeah. right. That's right. Zach? Yeah. Um, I didn't know Michelle was actually from New Hampshire. I went to, uh, so I went to high school in New Hampshire. I went to boarding school, I went to Exeter. Actually, Andrew Yang was a few years ahead of me there. He was, uh, was class of 97. I think he was class of 92, maybe. He's a little, little bit older than me. Uh, then went to Cornell University, uh, graduated in 2001 with a degree in government, went into the Marine Corps, went through a lot of different schools in the Marine Corps as well, uh, infantry officer course, um, a number of other different sort of tactical courses, uh, leadership courses um, uh, over my time there. And I think, you know, and I also, I come from a family of educators. My mom taught at PS 145 in Harlem. Uh, she was actually one of the only white teachers to cross the picket line during the 1968 teacher strike, which is a famous teacher strike uh, in New York City history. Uh, my mom was an educator uh, throughout most of her career. She's taught everything from kindergarten all the way through graduate school. Um, and I think more than just school, my education uh, uh, was, um, really a lot of mentors that I think about in my life. Um, I had a football coach in college. I played lightweight football at Cornell. I was a Marine officer in Vietnam. I was one of the chose to join the Marine Corps. I had a rabbi growing up. Thanks a lot. Sorry, my son's just bringing me some water. Um, thanks, Wolf. Um, 
I had a rabbi growing up uh, who played a huge role uh, in my commitment to service, uh, my Jewish education. Um, you know, and then throughout the Marine Corps and even my time after the Marine Corps, I could talk endlessly about, uh, you know, some of the corporal sergeants, staff sergeants, some of the officers I served with, um, who I were formative in my, my education as a leader and, and my commitment to public service. I was going to ask if uh, any of you guys would change your education experience, if anything, but it sounds like either of you wouldn't, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. I uh, want uh, Zach, why don't you go first this time? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, um, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I was, uh, I deferred from, from going to graduate school at Harvard three times. I was going to get a dual degree there and chose not to. And sometimes I regret not doing it. Other times I have no regrets about, about not going to graduate school. Um, you know, in terms of my time at Cornell, um, you know, I was, uh, I almost did a dual degree program, um, and I sometimes regret not doing a dual degree program, but overall, I, I don't really have any, any regrets. So I should warn you, you're talking to a Harvard grad with two degrees from Harvard, and uh, I think you made a horrible mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Michelle, I want to, your turn. Yeah, I, I have friends who call themselves recovering Harvard grads. <laughs> uh, maybe we could have been friends there, and then I do regret <laughs> having met you. During my time, I didn't go to Harvard. Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't have regrets. My, my public schooling uh, was uh, terrific. At least I thought it was at the time. Uh, I have a lot of, I, I can still, I mean, it, it's really uh, incredible how much of an impression a teacher makes on you as a child. I can remember my first through fifth grade teachers much more clearly than a lot of my high school teachers, I think, because they loom so large in your life, you know? Mrs. Andrikopoulos, my first year, Mrs. Vitalo, Mrs. Schamberger, Mr. Maloney, Mr. Clark. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I had a great public school education. I think that uh, a great public school education should be available for all children. Um, and it's, a, it, like I said, it really uh, distresses me that it isn't available for all children. Well, Wellesley was fantastic. I loved going to a woman's college. Um, I didn't think I would. My mom wanted me to go there and uh, I went along with it. And uh, once I got there, I was so happy. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I think it's Diane Sawyer tells a story about how she went to Wellesley as well. She would walk into the common room and say, God, I wish there was a, you know, a man in here. And then uh, as she got older, she'd walk into a room and say, wow, I wish there was another woman in here. Uh, and I still, I think it's weird to this day that I, I feel that way, that I walk into rooms sometimes and I'm still the only woman there. And when you look at even the field in the controller's race, it's still dominated uh, by men. No problem with men, Zach. Um, <laughs> it's just still, it's still very uneven uh, out there. I, I do want to jump off one of the things you said regarding a public school education, because that's obviously going to be a lot of the focus tonight. Um, so we're going to can jump right in a little bit of the com controller conversation, but uh, a lot of the questions are going to be framed around uh, the DOE <laughs> because that's a big part of obviously a lot of the viewers that are watching tonight, and we hope a big part of uh, whoever wins the race part of their job as well. So with that, I was going to say my limited understanding of the controller is that his or her chief responsibilities include preparing audits and overseeing how city agencies are spending their money. The DOE spends 30, close to $34 billion making it the, uh, per year, make it the largest funding, funded individual education department in the United States. It does have 1.1 million students, but it also spends the most per capita per student than any other education department in the US. And its high academic results are often criticized. I would even go further to say they're middling at best, but that's just me. I'll turn it over to Vito. Well, that's a little intro, and then I'll turn it over to Vito for your question. So the DOE has also been highly criticized in several areas, including but not limited to busing contracts, multiple administrative layers, use of consultants with questionable ties to the city or DOE administration. I mean, that's just to name a couple. Um, are there programs off the top of your heads or initiatives from the DOE that you have identified that could use more oversight? So I think when I think about some of the problems that we have with the Department of Education, um, and there's, uh, 
There's no shortage. In many ways, it's an embarrassment of riches in terms of looking at places for uh, greater outcomes and greater performance. But I actually, I think differently about the comptroller's office than we traditionally think about it. Um, so when we think about the, the comptroller's office, there's a number of primary responsibilities, everything from settling claims against the city, uh, management of the Bureau of Asset Management that, that over has oversight of the pension funds and works with the trustees of the pension funds to just determine how we're investing our dollars, um, approving city contracts. Uh, there's a whole host of, 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 um, of these responsibilities. And then the one that people pay attention to is the audit function. And often when we think about the audit function, um, at least at first glance, we think about, oh, well, you look at the books and you find savings. Well, over the last seven years, that's what Stringer has been doing. And he has found on a 92, about to be 98, almost $100 billion budget, about $32 million a year in savings, right? Just through sort of that traditional lens of the way that we audit the books and, and look for waste. Uh, the way I think about things, and this is because I have a deep background in government, but also in business, in nonprofits, in the military, where you have to be very focused on solving problems, is what are the problems we're trying to solve? And then from a planning process, what are the resources uh, that we have to apply over a certain amount of time to solve those problems? Um, and I love Vito, by the way, that you brought up the OODA loop. We can talk more about that later, but that is core to Marine Corps uh, planning process. And for those of you not familiar with the OODA loop, happy to stick around and, and talk about that later. Um, but uh, in particular with education, I think that what we really need to do is we need to sort of start thinking about what are the problems that we're trying to solve and what are the goals we're trying to accomplish with kids. And um, we know that the issues that we're facing in the city, in particular with education, are deeply interconnected, right? The, a child that is not reading at grade, grade level by third grade, and we know how critically important that is because that's the age when kids are starting to learn for um, information. Uh, starting to read for, for information, and it's critical to their, their development. And the statistics of how few students in our public school system are reading at grade level by third grade is staggering. Um, but how do we do that? It's not just about the curriculum. It's not just about the teachers. It's not just about smaller class sizes. It's about bringing a host of city services to bear and using a school as a single front door. We've done this extensively in the military space with great outcomes and reducing suicide increasing entrepreneurship, increasing outcomes for veterans, um, reducing unemployment, increasing how, uh, homeownership. Um, the same thing, we need a single front door for schools where we are holistically applying uh, some of the services the city's able to offer, whether it's kids who are coming to school who are shelter insecure, who have issues at home, mental health uh, issues, uh, food insecurity, technology issues. Um, but making sure that we are using a school as a place where we are identifying the problem that that child is facing and then bringing to bear all those resources. And the comptroller can play a role in finding models and programs that work to do that. Uh, there's a program nationally called the Program for, child, for Grade Level Reading that gets kids to read at grade level by third grade. There's a lot that we can learn from by creating benchmarks and, and sort of looking at the performance of other programs that are successful and seeing what they are doing and how they are doing it and then applying those learnings uh, within the Department of Education to ensure that we are advancing every single child uh, and, and meeting their needs and reducing the obstacles and barriers to their growth. And so I think it's much less about what is and what is not working and more about how do we develop these co uh, cohesive, cooperative synchronization efforts uh, to meet the needs of a child. Thank you, Zach. Um, Michelle? So, uh what, when I look at the controller's position, what I see is that historically it's held by someone who isn't necessarily uh, interested in the job so much, but really wanted to be the mayor or wants to be the mayor. And as a result, they really don't use the powers of the office as much as they could, because what they're doing is using the position as a soft launch for a mayoral run um, at the taxpayer's expense and trying to keep their head down, right? Showing up at events, et cetera. Uh, what that means is they're making personal political decisions rather than doing what's best for you and for your kids. So if you have someone who really does understand the power of an audit and what it can do, it can really make a huge difference. Um, I have spent decades following the money, uh, income statements, balance sheets, and cash flows. I didn't really go into my biography much, but I was at CNBC for 21 years where I was uh, an investigative financial journalist. I covered a lot of financial crises all over the world, which I think uh, 
bears a lot of, uh, helps me a lot in understanding the situation that New York City is going through right now and what we're going to go through. So if you understand income statements, balance sheets, and cash flows, you realize that they are things that provide transparency, they are tools, they can be be weapons in the right hands. And so, yes, we could absolutely take a deep dive into one of the largest, the largest, as you have pointed out, budget expense for New York City to see what can be done better and how can we get better outcomes. We need an outcomes-based approach, similar to what I think Zach is talking about, making sure that we're getting what we want uh, from the programs that we are funding, whoever is next in the next city hall at this point. Um, you know, the budget has gone up dramatically under Bill de Blasio, under two of our opponents, Corey Johnson and Brad Lander. It's gone from $72 billion to $92 billion. And ask yourself, does the city feel $20 billion a year better to you, even before COVID? And as Zach pointed out, it's gonna be $98 billion next year. What is that money being used for? we could absolutely take a look at, and, and let me be clear, in many cases, I'm not advocating cutting uh, spending. It's that what we have, we spend it badly. We spend it very badly. We need an outcomes-based approach that makes sure that we are getting the outcomes that we want. And you can do it with a traditional audit. You can do it with forensic audits. You can do it with performance audits. All of those things can be brought to bear uh, to the Department of Education. There's other things that you can do as well. Um, I was very distressed to see Richard Carranza announce that he was leaving and saying he did not know where he was going. And then three weeks later, he has a lucrative position at an ed tech company that had a lucrative contract with the city. Uh, they told the papers that uh, he had recused himself from the negotiations. Well, why would he recuse himself unless he knew there was a potential conflict of interest? So maybe he really did know where he was going. I'd like to get to the bottom of that and see if there are other contracts like that, that the uh, Department of Education clearly exceeded their authority on that original contract. That company wasn't supposed to get more than a million dollars and they ended up with $5 million. How does that happen? So I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit there that would uh, help us educate our children uh, much better so that we don't have the terrible outcomes that Zach has already highlighted for you and that I'm sure you are all aware of. So it's funny you both mentioned, you both mentioned audits and you both kind of referenced, um, <laughs> there's actually one of the questions from some of our, uh, some of our viewers, they wanted to know, should uh, a comptroller position be more than just a platform for running for mayor? I think you guys have both kind of touched on that. So let's skip that. But uh, you did both mention audits. Uh, one area that- Can I say, can I always say one thing about that? I was the first person in the race to say, I am not gonna run for mayor. And I've asked all my other opponents to uh, make the same pledge. Yeah, I'm happy to <laughs> <bond> that. Like, <laughs> up in, in debates. But, yeah. I think people make these commitments all the time. They end up running for other offices. I think you also have to look at the reason somebody is running for office, right? What is the purpose? What is driving them to this, to a career of public service? I'll tell you, I've been shot at before. Running for public office is really hard. I have a tremendous amount of respect that everybody that has chosen this as their chosen profession. Um, and a lot of the times they have to make difficult decisions. Me personally, um, one of the reasons I am so committed to public service, I lost a really, really good friend uh, when I was uh, growing up. A guy, young guy named John Schlesinger. He was like an older brother figure to me. And at John's funeral, the rabbi pulled us all aside and said, you all now have an obligation to live your life for John. And I repeated that story to my Marines on far too many occasions overseas and even at home. Uh, when we would lose a Marine to a roadside bomb, to a sniper, to a rocket attack, to a suicide bomber, I found myself repeat, repeating the words of, those, of that rabbi. And I'm very proud. Many of my Marines have gone on to continue service in many other ways. Some in law enforcement, some as EMPs, paramedics, some as teachers. I'm incredibly proud of them. And for a lot of us that have served overseas, in a war that many of us feel was meaningless and hard to justify, how do we justify the losses that, that we occur overseas? How do we justify that better Marines, better men, better women than us didn't make it home? And it's about the lives that we live. I don't, there's not a day I don't walk into my children's room that I'm not thinking about my friend Ronnie Winchester and the fact that he can't have a family. And so I have an obligation to live my life for Ronnie Winchester and for so many other Marines. And that's why I am choosing to serve in this capacity. 
It's not because I have my eyes in some office. It's not to serve my ego. It's because I am committed to a lifetime of service because of the folks that didn't come home. And I think that is a critically important component of this. So uh, appreciate the opportunity to put that to bed. It's very well said, Zach. Beautiful. Thank you both. In fact, to audit the one that was well said, both of you. Thank you for that. Uh, we weren't going to ask that, but since you both brought it up, uh, I also do want to tie it back to audits, which both of you also mentioned, and then we'll pass it to Zito. But uh, in 2013, John Liu did an audit of admissions into screened high schools. And from my recollection, he found an irregularity in 10 to 15% of the admissions. I also mentioned one of the pet, uh, Vito, I think once mentioned one of my pet peeves, uh, and you mentioned Chancellor Carranza, um, Michelle. Another pet peeve of mine is the multiple administrators, administrative layers he added to the DOE, uh, including chancellor, uh, deputy chancellors and executive superintendents, which has also been highly criticized. Are there any areas that jump, those are just two examples. Are there any areas that jump out at each of you uh, for an audit in the DOE? I think, Michelle, you kind of answered this question. I'll let you elaborate, but I'll let Zach go first because I think he talked about it a little less. Um, and specifically with the, you said with the, the DOE, correct? Yes. An audit, what jumps out of you as an audit for the, within the DOE? Yeah. Um, I think the layers of, of bureaucracy is one, right? So one of the things I'm really interested in is we spend $28,000 per student. Uh, and we have about, on average, about 28 students per classroom. Um, that's about $720,000, $800,000 going into every single classroom. Uh, that should be going into every single classroom. Um, and I think even just doing an analysis of where that seven, $800,000 is actually going, uh, the administrative and bureaucratic burden and oversight and overhead, and showing how those dollars are, not, are actually not going to uh, a child's education. Um, that that $28,000 is actually not going to that child and really auditing and looking at where those dollars are going and then finding places where we can start to make sure more of those dollars are going to where they are needed and not going to where they are not needed or where they're just serving a bureaucratic agency, bureaucratic agency like the Department of Education. Um, I, I did, you know, I saw the, the report that came out today um, and, uh, um, you know, have some familiarity with the, uh, with the audit that John Liu did. And it was interesting in how the, city is trying to cook the books a bit on um on specialized schools and gifted and talented programs um and that the ratios are not actually truly correct i think that's another great place to look okay. michelle do you want to elaborate or you can yeah I, I would say what you know when i looked at the the john lou audit that you brought to our attention um it's it's essentially a performance audit uh and those are the kind of things that we can do we can do deep dives into various aspects of any agency to take a look at um, how we can get uh, better outcomes. And I think the one thing I would add is that the controllers also gotta be able to deliver the, the message and there isn't an official mechanism to affect change. It's essentially the bully pulpit um, and telling the story and making sure people understand the story um, and holding the mayor and the city council accountable when the story doesn't match the goals that we should be having for the city, which are educating our children, bringing jobs back, turning around the economy, making sure that we bring investment back to New York City, helping our small businesses. Um, when we have a mayor and a city council who are doing those things, you know, I'm gonna be an asset and an ally. And when they're not doing those things, I'm gonna be an antagonist. But how do you get that message out? I'm a storyteller. I've been a journalist for 30 years. So I know how to tell stories and to make sure that people understand what's at stake and how we can make a change. I think oftentimes the position is held by someone who doesn't actually know how to use the bully pulpit well enough to actually drive changes that should come about as a result of the audits that are being done. Okay. Vito, sorry to yep. Thank you. I just a quick follow up. The reason that, um, that that 2013 audit is so important, especially now, is because middle and high school students just received their, um, their results, right? Results of a lottery in very many cases, in cases of screen programs. And what can you as a controller do to ensure the integrity of those lotteries? I mean, I had a very heated uh, conversation with my superintendent on the CDC, and I'm talking about the algorithms that we use. Can you compel the DOE to be transparent in how these lotteries are conducted, 
who is overseeing these lotteries, what the what the range is, uh, who's overseeing wait lists. I mean, all of this stuff is really compelling because at the end of the day, without this transparency and without this oversight, you know, we're not to believe that someone in the DOE and their children, their loved ones may they may jump the they may jump the line and they may take a seat that's really not rightfully theirs. Uh, abs- that would be absolutely unacceptable. The process should be transparent and it should be available to every student. Um, the degree to which the controller can do a performance audit on that process, I would absolutely look at that and champion the the fact that we have got to have a system that works for everyone and to make sure that we don't have administrators abusing the system to make sure that their children get what other children cannot. That is completely unacceptable. Thank you. That was the, the basis of John Lou's audit. And that was the insinuation. He never came out and said that, but that was the underlying tone that was delivered. Uh, Zach, go ahead, finish up. Yeah, I mean, look, I. I think part of your question is, is what can the comptroller do besides uh, um, providing an outlier platform for greater transparency of what's happening? Um, I think, to be honest, it, it's somewhat limited in this case. I think there are other areas, particularly around contracting, uh, where the city comptroller has some very real teeth. Uh, but this is one where through the audit function and through the power of subpoena, uh, you can at least provide the transparency. So people can be horrified at what's actually happening. Kush? Right. We're going to switch gears a little bit, and we're not going to limit your responses in the DOE. Uh, there's more to come, of course. But um, what will your top priority be day one as comptroller? It does not have to be limited to the DOE, as we said. And what would be some of the first things you would tackle as comptroller, particularly to rein in what appears to be runaway spending, which I also think both, both of you yeah. do as well? Uh, who went last. Uh, well, Zach, you seem ready to talk, so you go first. Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the current administration, uh, the current city council, led by some of the other folks in this race, um, are walking our city into a fiscal hurricane right now. It is a fiscal hurricane. Uh, the next mayor is going to inherit a 12 to $15 billion deficit over the first three years of their mayoralty. Uh, that assumes that we get 400,000 people back to work. It assumes we find a billion dollars in labor savings. It assumes that real estate revenues stabilize. And we know real estate, real estate taxes stabilize, uh, which are traditionally the most stable of our, our city's taxes, about 30% of city revenues. They're down a billion dollars. It assumes that real estate, uh, that, that income taxes from Wall Street performance remain stable. All of those things are rosy projections. The fiscal hurricane could be quite worse. Um, and there are things that the city needs to start doing now to start addressing it that it isn't. But I think the number one thing that is comptroller, uh, uh, the first thing is, is we got to get the city working again. We got to get people back to work. Uh, we have plans through a public bank, through a five borough investment strategy to make investments to help bring businesses back, to make it easier for businesses to operate in New York City. But we've got to get the economy going. We got to get people back to the office. That's got to be a huge priority. I think number two. You know, we talked about this a little bit. Uh, people always want to know where are you going to find waste. I mentioned this already in terms of the DOA. Uh, we have got to bring the city into the 21st century. We have got to find ways of tying dollars to outcomes. You cannot know what you are wasting money on if you don't know what the desired outcome is you're trying to get from a dollar spent. Uh, I'll give you a quick example of that homelessness. We spent $3.2 billion a year on homelessness, 2x what it was before de Blasio took office. That's more than almost every major U.S. city combined. It is an astronomical amount of money to spend on homelessness. But the way those dollars are spent, they're not spent on getting people out of homelessness. They're not spent on keeping people out of homelessness. They're spent on a corrupt, broken shelter system with perverse incentives that keep people in the shelter system. That doesn't work for anybody. Um, and instead, there are some great models out there. The city has a program called the Home Base Program that is highly effective, that we're not spending money on, that we're not investing in. And so it's by really finding ways to tie dollars to outcomes to solve problems uh, and to know where we are and are not spending dollars effectively. Um, But I think a lot of this also comes down to just management and there's some changes that need to occur within the uh, with the comptroller's office whether it's how we appropriate uh, or register city contracts uh, to um, the Bureau of Asset Management with the pension fund actually bringing in-house some greater talent but uh, 
I could go on and on, but I, I want to be fair to the time and I'll turn it over to Michelle. Thank you for that. Yeah, so um, first, what we haven't done for a long time, and they only just reintroduced them this year, there's something called the PEG program, the program to eliminate the gap. I think it's an unfortunate name because it sounds like it's a cost cutting program. I think of it more as an efficiency finder where every single agency kind of looks at itself and says, and by the way, people within the agency are sometimes the best advocates for figuring out where spending should be cut and where it should be increased sometimes. Um, so we can take a hard look at every single area to see where can we get, again, to Zach's point, we keep bringing this up, better outcomes. Um, we haven't had a PEG program in a long time. They just reintroduced them as a result of the financial crisis that we were, uh, that was, you know, the impending doom that we were facing until we got this very generous package from the federal government that's giving us a couple of years of breathing room. So that would be the first thing I would do is, is talk to agencies and say, let's, you know, let's take a look at how can we help you make your, you know, your agency more efficient. You're going to hear some people, and I've heard this in the mayor's race, every single agency has got to find 5% in savings. I don't think that's a good approach. I mean, there are some areas where you need to spend more and some areas where you need to spend less, even within an agency itself, where one line item, you think, you know, this program's really old and it's not very effective and it should go away. And this one is, and we should actually allocate more funds to it. So that's number one, is to really bring this sense of, okay, where can we all work together to make changes? Um, the next thing is I really want to take have strict and strong oversight on this bailout money that we're getting. Uh, the Department of Education is going to get several billion dollars worth of unrestricted funds. I think we should have a clearer uh, definition of what those funds should be used for. So that way we know that we're getting uh, the outcomes that we want. Um, and we really have to think very carefully about what's going to happen with Midtown Manhattan. We have unemployment in the Bronx at roughly 14%. It's the worst of all the boroughs. Queens is at 11%. A large part of that is because of what is happening in Midtown Manhattan with Midtown occupancy rates running still roughly around 16% during the day. Businesses here are dying. They are desperate for people to come back. And when you wonder why unemployment in the Bronx and Queens are as high as that, it's because the folks who live in, in, in Queens where I live or in the Bronx, they're coming into the city every day to work at restaurants, retail fronts, all of these places that have been closed for a year. Luckily, there's been uh, very strong unemployment, which has meant that we haven't seen, um, you know, and people haven't been pushed out of their homes. So that's been putting things at bay, but we have got to figure out what we're gonna do with Midtown Manhattan. What is gonna be the impact of work from home? I think it's personally overrated and overstated, but the impact is not going to be zero. It's going to be something and it's going to affect Midtown, which provides the largest percentage of what I call the GCP, the gross city product. And it's really crucial for the budget because every summer, the owners of these buildings, you know, all the landlords, they submit their income and expense statements. And that's how the city assesses what the tax base, what they're going to assess them in taxes. Well, this last year is going to look really bad. So what are the assessments going to look like? And how is that going to feed through to real estate taxes, which as Zach pointed out, is the largest provider of revenue for the city. Um, luckily, we have two years of breathing room to figure out what's gonna happen there, what's gonna happen in Midtown because we've gotten this very generous bailout from the feds, from the federal government. Um, but we've gotta be flexible and figure out how are we gonna reimagine the city in a way that makes sure that we can get the Bronx unemployment rate down to the pre-pandemic level where we're really seeing uh, income start to rise finally. Those are the goals that we have to have. Whoever uh, is in city hall next year, whoever the mayor is, whoever the members of the city council are, and those are gonna be the things that I'm very focused on. Okay, that's a great segue into two additional topics we're gonna, that we're uh, about to jump into. Uh, one of them is going to be NYPD and school safety. Uh, I'm gonna let uh, Vito address this one. Another one will be taxes. Uh, before you jump to the, <laughs> NYPD and school safety issue, though, I will warn that uh, Vito is former NYPD with us today. So I'll let him take this next question. I'm sorry, you're going to warn us about what about Vito? Vito used to work for the New York Police Department. Oh, fantastic. All right. I wanted to thank Zach for his service because, yes, I was a lieutenant in the New York City Police Department for 32 years, and that's why we both know what the OODA loop is. 
Where, uh, what, what precinct were you in? So I was mostly, most of my career was spent in Manhattan, actually with the old transit police. And I stayed in there for my entire career, uh, mostly around Union Square. The okay, tip of Manhattan on the east side, all the way to the Manhattan Bridge. So I, I, I fought to bring my translator over here in 2007. Um, it's a long story. Testified for the United States Senate, helped establish a special immigrant visa. Um, he came over in 2000. We lost him to cancer in 2011. But the reason I bring it up is uh, he was like a second father to me. Two of his four daughters are now in the NYPD. Uh, one was on the Staten Island Ferry. Uh, the other is now in the 5th Precinct. The one that was on the Staten Island Ferry is now in the legal department. But they've got her back out on the streets uh, right now, sort of going all over the city before she goes back to the legal department. Yeah. And so all hands on deck these days. Um, but specifically as the controller and looking from the, the financial point of view, do you have an opinion, both of you, about whether the uh, school safety agents should stay with the NYPD or remove to the purview of the DOE? Michelle? Um, I'll, I'll take that. I, I, on that specific question, uh, what I would say is I, I do want to audit the NYPD. Uh, when I have looked at, there are three agencies that I really want to take a look at uh, when I'm a uh, controller. The NYPD, health and hospitals, and also the Department of Education. Um, I think we should audit the NYPD. We haven't seen an audit when I started running for this race. One of the first things I did was look to see when was the last time that we had audited the NYPD. And I couldn't find any evidence that there had been a full-scale audit. Um, <clears throat> And then there was a newspaper story that confirmed that there actually hadn't been a full one. There's been small aspects of the NYPD that have been audited, uh, but I think it merits taking a look at the whole budget. Um, we have absolutely got to combat the rising levels of crime that we have seen in the city as a result of the pandemic. Shootings are up, murders are up, uh, attacks are up. We've seen terrible anti-Semitic crime. We've seen terrible attacks on Asian Americans recently, elderly Asians. I mean, we have got to have people feeling safe in New York City. People have to feel safe that they're, when they go into the subway. At the same time, our black and brown communities very much feel like they have been brutalized, that they are over-policed. There has got to be um, a rebuilding of trust between the police and our black and brown communities. I don't think all of those things are in conflict. What can the controller do about that? The controller can look at um, the budget and, and a budget is different than an, than an audit, right? A budget is what you intend to spend. An audit really takes a look at what did you spend on? And are there areas where we are over-policing? And are there areas where we are under-policing? And in areas where we are over-policing, can we reallocate funds to outcome evidence-based programs that show us that they have outcomes that are proven, things like cure violence, uh, that also at the same time help rebuild trust between the community and the police officers that serve them. So what about uh, school safety agents specifically, ma'am? So school safety agents, um, I, you know, I think we need them. I know that there was a controversy about moving them out versus putting them in. I would want to, you know, hear the merits of both sides of the issue to really make a decision. It's, it's not necessarily within the purview of the comptroller, so much. I spent a lot of time thinking about how we're going to, you know, manage the pension funds, but I am absolutely open to hearing your views on that and, and being uh, more informed about uh, what the both sides think on the issue. You're welcome to audit the NYPD, just please don't touch my pension. I yeah, well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to protect your pension, Vito. I'm going Thank to you. Thank make you so your much. pension better, okay? <laughs> You know, I am specifically going to look at your pension. <laughs> <laughs> it is very generous. I when people say when people say thank you for your service, I say, well, thank you for my pension. <laughs> I didn't do it for free. So thank you. Mm. Uh, look, I think I think the the school safety agents on the NYPD. The NYPD has uh, helped professionalize uh, school safety agents, and we know that there's been a lot of uh, improvement improvements to school safety agents um, under the, uh, as they have been under the NYPD. Um, I am open to them moving under the DOE as long as we don't lose that, the, the sort of the training and the resource and the professionalism that they have gained by being under the NYPD. But I think we sort of have to sort of avoid these sort of knee jerk reflexes uh, that we currently find ourselves in, in this political climate. Um, I will say, though, just on the subject of the NYPD, um, there's sort of always two different conversations here. One is about defund and about auditing the NYPD. I think one thing that needs to happen is one of the reasons that there has not been a 
significant audit of the NYPD is the NYPD has too many bank accounts. Uh, many city agencies operate out of one city out of one bank account. The, the NYPD operates out of so many, it is almost impossible to understand where dollars are and where dollars are going. And so I think there is a real need for the controller to work in conjunction with the mayor and the city council uh, to mandate the consolidation of uh, the NYPD's bank accounts uh, to make it easier to track uh, the, the spending of, of money. Um, on top of that, when it comes to uh, the issues of police reform, um, look, I have made life and death decisions in my life, um, as I imagine that Vito has as well. Um, I was personally selected by the commander of Marine Special Operations to build the assessment and selection program and the recruiting program for U.S. Marine Corps Special Operations. Um, when I think about the NYPD, I think that I can provide, um, I can be a real resource um, to the city uh, based on my background and sort of identifying four things that we can do to improve the NYPD. And I think one of the things that the next mayor has to solve is repairing the relationship between the NYPD and the public. We cannot continue to exist as a city with this dysfunctional relationship. And I think that there are some four modest changes or four real changes that can occur within the NYPD, starting with taking a real look at uh, who we are recruiting, uh, what their disposition is, what their age is, what their mentality is. Um, there was a young woman, uh, Alexis of Vogel, police officer in Midtown. Uh, many of you probably saw the video of her recently uh, when four, uh, including a, when a four-year-old child was shot. Um, officer Vogel immediately applied a tourniquet. Uh, I will tell you, applying a tourniquet, tourniquet is very hard. Applying a tourniquet on a child is even harder. He then immediately started looking for secondary wounds. Not everybody knows to do that. I know Marines that, that have messed that up. And then she heard down the street that there was an ambulance and her maternal instincts, her instincts kicked in. She picked up that child and she ran that child down the street to that ambulance. Here's a kicker. Officer Vogel, you know what she was before she was a police officer? She was a teacher. teacher. She was a teacher. She's exactly the type of person we want to be recruiting into the NYPD. He had exactly the right type of training. When you read the 111 page report of what happened on the streets of New York City last year when the mayor implemented this curfew, when he put officers out into this situation where he created a combustible situation, um, the exact opposite was occurring. So number one is we need to look at who we are recruiting into the NYPD, the type of training that they are receiving for this very complex environment that they are now operating in the city. Number three, we need to take a hard look at who we are promoting. I have met and gotten to know some remarkable precinct commanders who are doing everything right, who are building relationships with the community, um, who are, who are uh, really invested, and many of them will never get promoted. Many of them are at loggerheads with some of the senior leadership in the NYPD. So we also have to look at who we are promoting. And then number four is having a ruthless level of accountability. I was in the Marine Corps. Um, I come from a culture where if you got a speeding ticket on base, that's the end of your career as an officer. I come from a culture where, you know, you can bear with me for a minute. Uh, last summer, there was a tragic accident off the coast of California. An amphibious assault vehicle sank. Nine Marines were killed, drowned. Uh, the Marine Corps fired the battalion commander, the colonel. The colonel was one of my instructors at the Infantry Officer Course, one of the best officers I have ever served with, Colonel Bronzy. Um, and the two-star general lost his job. The lieutenant colonel who lost his job was the son of a two-star general I served with, who was also a story Marine officer. And the Marine Corps fired these officers uh, who probably could have done nothing to prevent this accident. But they were sending a message that everything you do or fail to do in your chain of command, you bear responsibility for. And they were sending a message that the lives of Marines matter. Um, and I guarantee you right now, every Marine officer is making sure that their Amtraks are mechanically sound, that the plugs are and screws are tight and that those Amtraks aren't gonna sink and that saves people's lives. So the NYPD, I think there is a audit of who we're recruiting, how we're training them, who we're promoting and the levels of accountability that if we do those four things, we can radically improve the relationship between the NYPD and the public um, and have real public safety without um, sacrificing justice in this town. Vito, you there? How's your connection? Great, yeah. I'm going to jump in for a second. I think Vito's having some technical difficulties. Michelle, can I pass it to you for a moment? Yeah, sure. Your thoughts? Uh, do you need their question again? Oh, 
I thought I already answered it. Oh, apologies. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't do us all. Apologies. Let's get uh, to be back on track. Yeah, the next topic I said we'd talk about is uh, ta- uh, taxes. And we had a little bit of a setup here. Uh, and I'll explain why. Um, it's been reported that enrollment across New York City public schools has dropped in New York City during COVID, uh, during this past COVID year plus, uh, on the order of 4 to 7%, depending on your sources. I might even have the percentages slightly wrong. Uh, anecdotally, it's, it's believed to be higher than that, as high as 10%. I know in Manhattan, it's been reported as high as 10%. And in particular, my district, most confident about this number, uh, district, Education District 2, which is about half or more of Manhattan, um, that number is high as 20 to 25% of families have left their schools, their public schools. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're second, but you, uh, you said that you, the numbers that you're citing are, are disenrollment. Yes, okay. removal right. of removal of families yeah. from the DOE public education system. Okay. Obviously, some of them might have gone to private schools, but many, as evidence from which I know CNBC reports on, many is because they fled to the suburbs. Um, a lot of this is because has been blamed on uh, the DOE's lurching about blindly, blindly in a in a COVID remote and blended learning. Uh, but a lot of it, uh, many parents feel, many of the parents in this that are listening tonight feel it's because of an unending attack on gifted and talented between middle schools and specialized high schools. Obviously, this is going to be disastrous for tax revenues going forward and therefore affects New York City and most likely your office. Uh, your thoughts on this? Because I think, as you mentioned before, this might not be something you have direct control over as a comptroller, but I think should impact you in a number of ways. No, yeah. You- and yeah, yeah, we'll start with uh, who went. I don't know. Michelle, let's start with Michelle, since you spoke first. I, I went first last time. Zach, if you want to go first this time, doesn't or you want me to go either way. Go ahead. I think you're ready. Michelle, okay, let's, sure. I, I'll pick you. Okay, got it. Um, so uh, first, with the pandemic, I didn't want to take anything off the table because we had, were going through such unprecedented times. Um, and we didn't know if we were going to get a bailout from the federal government. Um, but I, what I have always said is, you know, we're not going to be able to tax our way out of this situation. What we need to do when we look at taxes is do they pass the do no harm test? Uh, do they drive people away or, or not? And what we just saw, for example, come out of Albany, I don't think pass the do no harm test because you can end up with less revenue than what you started with. And especially when we are so concerned about what is happening here with um, the real estate values that drive so much tax revenue for the city. Um, we have to be working on attracting people back to New York, attracting businesses back to New York, sm- supporting small businesses, um, making sure that we improve employment levels. Those are the things that if we focus on them, we will have more tax revenues and the tax revenues that we need. You know, keep in mind, the city's budget by law has to be balanced on a quarterly basis. So the numbers that Zach and I have both cited about how big the budget has gotten, it's because we were living through a boom. Um, If we hadn't gotten the money from the federal government, we would be looking at a very, very dire situation. We've gotten so much money from the federal government, we now have two years of breathing room. Uh, So I think this kind of knee jerk, this lurching towards taxes as the first go-to thing isn't something that we have to do right now or that we should do right now until we figure out what does New York City look like when we really figure out the impact of work from home? Do families come back? You know, the schools are gonna reopen in September, they announced today, hallelujah. Everybody's gonna be in school, no, um, no remote learning. Is that gonna you know, give people confidence to be back here? Um, so, you know, that's the way I, I look at, whenever I'm uh, you know, given any question about taxes, that's the way I look at them. But a little bit more than just raising taxes and whether or not families come back. Also, we believe that families left because of the poor education system. And we believe many have left because of the unending attack on specialized programs like gifted and talented middle, oh. school, middle schools and specialized high schools. Could For sure. Out of it as well. For sure. I thought you were posing a question about about taxes. It's, it's, it's all related. OK, but yes. For us, that's related because. By, by these people leaving in droves, and particularly it's been, prefer- as far as we can tell from the numbers, a little more preferential towards Manhattan and Manhattan, 
this is going to drive down tax revenue. Right. All related question. It will. Yes, it will. Also, it is the knee jerk reaction is like you said to raise taxes as well on top of this. But I, in our opinion, the big problem is the fact that the families have left. The fact that families have voted with their feet and said we have no confidence in a public school education within the DOE. So we are tying it back to the DOE again, as I promised we would. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, if you could just um, make that. If, if any connections there for you. Yeah, no, sure. I mean, I, th I think it's all part of a package. We have got to have a recovery for New York City that leaves no one behind. And how do you do that? You bring back jobs, you bring back investment, uh, you get people to want to come back to New York. So uh, attacking those underlying concerns that parents have, making sure that the, um, the gifted and talented programs do stay in place. So that way their children, if they can't afford uh, you know, a fancy private school to know that they have options in the public schools is extremely important and to know that there's going to be stability and that they're actually going to open. Um, yeah, I think that's all part of a piece. It's all about what makes New York City um, the place that people want to come back to. Okay. Zach, your thoughts? Thank you. Uh, Michelle. I'm a little bit confused as to what the, what the specific question is, other than I agree with you. Um, <laughs> um, well, we feel that it was it was an open ended question. It was your thoughts on on the fact that many families have left the left the DOE system, and how that relates to decreased taxes, well, in, a, in an alarming amount, um, because we feel as many as twenty five percent of families have left certain districts. Um, thoughts, yeah, yeah. solutions. I, uh, I know they're not directly within your purview as comptroller, but certainly related. No, I, I think it is. I think part of the job of comptroller is to be the, the canary in the coal mine, or at least to sound the alarm. Um, there's so much the city's been through in the last couple of years, it's entirely predictable, entirely predictable, um, that the city has been unprepared for. And we know that we are walking into a fiscal hurricane. Uh, we know that the impact of families disenrolling, how many families have disenrolled, not just because of the quality of the education, but simply because there has no, been no clarity until this morning that schools were going to be fully reopened this fall. How many families had to make a decision a month ago as to whether they were going to renew a lease or whether they were going to go move their kids, their family in June to New Jersey, to Fairfield County, to Westchester County, simply because the city failed to plan and communicate forward. Right. So like some of this is about specialized schools. Some of this is about the quality of the education. Some of this is simply about the city's failure to communicate and to make firm commitments into the future. Um, and it's costing all of us. I mean, you know, every child that disenrolls from the public school system uh, costs another child that's staying in the public school system um, just through the twenty, twenty two, twenty four thousand dollars in, in uh, reimbursements that are going into the, the, the system. Um, so this is a huge issue. The lost tax revenue is a huge issue. Michelle spoke about Midtown. Um, we're not doing anything right now to get Midtown working again. Midtown usually has over 3 million subway riders going into Midtown. How do we fund the MTA without 3 million people going into Midtown on a day? We can't. The MTA will not be fiscally solvent. But like all of these things, like we, we know what these problems are. We just don't have politicians who are willing to actually roll up their sleeves and address them. And it is leading the city into an existential crisis for the next bench of talent that you will be electing on June 12th, early voting, June 22nd for the primary um, to deal with. And we've got to, you know, we've got to elect people who are going to have their hands on the wheel. Um, we're going to have to have some adults in the room. And right now we don't. And it's costing all of us. You know, to that point, the, um, remember this data point, the population of New York in 1990 was smaller than it was in 1940. And that's because of the 70s. Uh, and if we don't get this election right, we could go back there again. That's how much is riding on this election and, and making the right choices for uh, City Hall, for the mayor, and for the controller. You know, yeah, Kush, I'll give you another example here of, of predicting the future. Um, one thing that nobody is talking about, or at least within the city, is what this year has cost our kids in terms of learning loss, in terms of their mental health, in terms of their future earning potential. Um, we know that this year has had massive effects on our children. Um, and that's like, what is the city doing to address this, right? We haven't really seen a huge increase. We haven't seen an increase in robust summer programming. 
we saw a press conference about it, but the city hasn't even started hiring teachers and counselors to run this robust summer programming. Um, we now hear today that kids are going to be back in school full time this this fall. I don't know how we're actually going to accomplish that. Um, and we don't even have systems in place right now to audit and understand what that learning loss is. Um, if I were comptroller, if I were mayor, if I was the head of the Department of Education today, I would be convening world-class technology companies, edutainment companies, gaming companies, to create online tools just to do an audit for every single child to understand where they are in their learning journey. I mean, we could just start there. We could be doing that today to understand where every kid is so that then once they come back to school, we could have an understanding of what the gaps are that we're going to need to solve for once kids back in the classroom how we're going to recover their lost learning, how we're going to rebuild their relationships, how we're going to rebuild their resiliency. Um, those conversations aren't even taking place in this administration. And in 22nd, we have an opportunity to change that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughtful answers. Uh, I'm going to pass to Vito now. Okay. Well, I understand that um, I understand. Let's spend an hour, and uh, I understand that um, Michelle has to leave us. You have I, I have another days. Zoom. It's awful. It's awful. That's okay. That's all right. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm going to stick spending with the time. The uh, thank you so much for spending the hour with us. We really do appreciate it. Thank so, you. Um, Thanks for having me. I think the next question it has to dovetail with um, ranked choice voting. Real quick, both of you favorite oh. subjects. Name three. Oh, did Michelle leave? She really did. She had a Zoom. Yeah. yeah, let's finish I'm, it up anyway. Let's, Michelle's why, why, doing why to we, another Zoom. <laughs> why, why don't we end on this one? We'll, we'll, uh, oh. we'll, um, why don't we start off, Vito? So the question is, we do a ranked choice voting. And uh, tell us your three favorite subjects in high school. And we'll have Vito go. Sorry, you're breaking up just a little bit. I couldn't. My two favorite. Three favorite subjects. Three favorite Favorite subjects. Okay, I'll go first. Mine was English, biology, and probably uh, anatomy and physiology. I was <laughs> going to be a doctor, but that didn't work out. Bush, you're next. I can't believe I'm about. I'm, I'm next. Sorry. If, uh, my three would be um, biology, AP biology, because I was also going to be a doctor once upon a time. Uh, AP computer science, because I learned how to hack into my computer's accounts. Uh, and third would be AP uh, math. Yes, I was a math and science geek. And it's only ranked third because my school did not offer BC instead of AB. Thanks, Coach. I guess the candidate's the only one left. <laughs> <laughs> Zach, so, you're uh, right. are we are we in a safe space right now? Can I can I tell yes. the story? Yeah, sure. I mean, well, I, I just said I hacked into my teacher's account, so uh, it's a pick. So my. I went to Cornell. I was, uh, I was in the ag school and uh, my junior year, I really should not be telling this story in this form. My junior year, I went to my advisor who I had not seen in three years. And she said, you can't graduate on time. You haven't taken all of the required courses um, with your degree. And I was a, um, I was a science major. And I said, well, what, what can I uh, graduate with? Enough? She said, you could graduate on time in history, government or English. Um, cause I had taken a plethora of, I, I just, when I opened up that course catalog every day or at the beginning of the school year, to me, it was like a gift. It was like manna from heaven, right? Like I just, I, there were courses that I just wanted to take and I couldn't avoid taking. So I ended up, uh, switching from the arts, from the ag and life science school, which is a science, uh, which is a state school to the arts and science school, um, which is a private part of, uh, you know, so my last year actually cost as much as my first three years combined became a government major. But the point of the story is my three favorite subjects were history, government, and, and English. And what? And English. Got it. I think we're uh, done on time. Vito. Done. Almost, right? A few minutes, 8.03, not bad. So I want to thank Yatin Chu and Jean Han and the rest of the Place New York City members for helping us out with this evening. Again, thank you to Zach and Michelle at Abstentia for joining us. Everybody, thank you again. Good night.